Hey, my name is Rob, Wu, the CEO of Cosbox. And also today I have Taylor Adachi from Carousel Ranch. So really excited to share with you um, some of her fundraising hacks and tips. Taylor's amazing, been fundraising like crazy. So really excited to dive a little deeper into how she's been able to be successful raising hundreds of thousands of dollars every single year. Also really excited just to walk you through her campaign that just ended and walking through some of the features that she used as well as uh, some of the functionality in order to raise over $100,000 on this year's fundraising, fundraising initiative, which happens to be a peer-to-peer -peer campaign. Taylor, so I want to start. Um, who are you and what organization are you with? Hi, I'm Taylor. I'm our Associate Executive Director here at Carousel Ranch. Uh, Carousel Ranch provides equestrian therapy for children with disabilities and a young adult, a vocational training program for young adults with special needs. So how do you all do that? Uh, how do you accomplish your mission on a day-to-day -day basis? Um, for us, it's all about programming. Um, you know, we come in and our for me personally, I come in to support our programs every day, and that's through fundraising, um, you know, day-to-day -day admin support, um, making sure parents and volunteers are coming every day. Um, and then sometimes if they need extra help, putting on some tennis shoes or boots and uh, working with the kids. <laughs> yeah. So, Taylor, I know you've been with Carousel Ranch for quite a while now. How did you fall into it? Or was this something that you sought after? I'm curious to see like what what has been your journey as well as what background led you to led you to do what you're doing today? Yeah, I kind of pretty much how you said I fell into this position. Um, I was going to school uh, for to get a degree in special events, um, recreation, tourism management, and my mom was in a gym class with my executive director. Um, I knew my executive director for years because we, um, her daughter and I did Girl Scouts together. Um, and so my mom offhandly was like, hey, my daughter needs to do an internship. Can she help you out any events that you have coming up? And so my boss was like, sure, why not? We'd love the extra help. Um, so I came in and her previous assistant uh, went on maternity leave a week before I started. So I really got thrown into the position. Um, and after that summer, I did about 400 hours. I fell in love with the place. Um, her previous assistant didn't want to come back after having her baby. Um, so my boss offered me the position. I started out as her assistant part-time. And then over the years, um, I grew more into a full-time position and then grew into our associate executive director. And then now we're um, going to be transitioning and to me becoming the next executive director. Well, congratulations. So think, it's been a wild ride. <laughs> it's been a wild ride. I do remember chatting with you years ago, maybe 2016. So what what is mm -hmm. that? Seven or eight years ago. So I think it's incredible yeah. to see your journey and how you progress helping build Carousel Ranch. So it sounds like uh, you don't have a formal fundraising experience. You're not a formal marketer. Uh, you're oh. kind of like a lot of the nonprofits that are listening in today where they kind of just fell into it. You know, you're trying to figure things out. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious from your experience, uh, what is your number one fundraising tip or hack for someone like yourself? Yeah, I I know, so I, my background is in events. I've done a lot of events um, throughout my earlier years. And so when I got thrown into this fundraising world, um, it took a while for me to figure out like, oh, we're trying to save money, not spend the money and trying to earn money. So um, it was a huge learning experience. My executive director is a huge mentor and she's um, taking me under her wing and she's been in the fundraising business for way longer than I was. So I think some of the main hacks I would have to say is it's all about a personal relationship. Um, every time I go out and ask somebody, it's because I already have a previous relationship with them um, and it might take a year or two years, but down the line, then they'll be able to give you a really big check. Um, it's never hard for me to ask for money now because they're friends and they believe in me. Um, I have to say the other hack, a lot of people, I, I when they get thrown into the fundraising, is not asking. Um, people are always afraid to ask, but people 
you have to in this in this line of business. Um, for us, it's the easier part is just asking and then staying quiet, and then people will always respond. But yeah, those are some of the other ones. I think um, another really big hack for I've learned within a, my nonprofit and how it's seen successful in our community is to brand. Um, specifically, if you're doing a campaign or if you're doing an event, um, brand it well so people can recognize your event coming up. Like in February in Santa Clarita, everyone knows that it's Carousel Wishes and Valentine Kisses with Carousel Ranch. They see us within businesses. They see us online. Everyone knows about us. Same thing with our um, August event. Heart of the West is an event that's been going on for year after year, and it's branded. Um, so that's been really uh, some of the main hacks that we've seen. Yeah. So so just in summary, a fundraising tip on number one, have a great relationship with the potential donors that you want to ask. Then tip number mm-hmm. two is to actually make a structured ask so that or call to action so that folks will actually make a donation. Yeah. Okay. And then number three mm-hmm. is to really focus on the branding aspect of whatever fundraising campaign that you're doing so it is memorable. Uh, in the local community. So let's dive into a little yeah. bit of this. Um, so with, with your tip number two, I'm curious. Uh, mm-hmm. Tip number two, you mentioned that you have to make an ask. What is what is the basic structure of making an ask? I'm curious. Like if you could share like uh, what, what is kind uh, of formula that works or maybe it's just very simple. So for the way we work with our, I guess going with Causebox and our annual campaign, when we talk to our um, fundraisers, we always say at least throw out a number because not throwing out a number, they are probably going to be, they're either going to say yes, no, or probably give more. So we always tell our fundraisers, um, you know, lead to kind of the why, Hey, I'm fundraising for Carousel Ranch. I believe in their mission. Um, this is my personal story. And then we go into, and now will you please donate $5? Will you please donate $10? Um, and that's how we do for when we call on our phone-a-thon. Um, that's part of our um, annual campaign is that we we call people and we're like, hey, we've noticed you've given in the past. Um, would you mind donating $25? Um, you know, I think it, there's not really a too formal formula, I guess. But, you know, I think just talking, kind of saying why you're donating and why you're here and then just throwing out at least a number. I think leaving it open-ended is just, room for people to be like no or ignore it mm-hmm. yeah yeah i love that how it, this is so simple where it's having a really great personal compelling story uh, with the reason why mm-hmm. then uh, making a simple ask with a specific dollar amount and then someone can just respond yeah. by saying yes i can do it or no i'll do something less or that's too low i'll do something even bigger so helping the donor already have a reference point in terms of a decision versus having them think through how much to actually donate. So I love that. Mm-hmm. Uh, the other- And funny- I think throwing out, oh, sorry. I think just throwing out a number, um, like for us, we we look at someone's giving history and we can kind of pick out like, okay, they can probably donate 25, 50, a hundred dollars. Um, or if it's somebody on social media and you're throwing out an amount, they can say no, or they can give less or they can give more, but you just have to say something. Um, because you have to at least give your, uh, shoot your shot. Like if you don't ask, it's never going to happen. Kind of, uh, take it like at least try. Right. Right. And do you find that, um, your, your dollar ask, uh, <laughs> when you do that, you change, um, the, the dollar amount based on a specific audience or maybe a specific channel of how you do fundraising. Like for example, the specific ask for peer to peer is $75. Well, if we're doing uh, something else that's not peer-to-peer, for example, then it's a hundred dollars. But how do you formulate uh, for Carousel Ranch at least the dollar figure to use? Um, I think it just depends on the person. Okay. Um, we're more based on the statistics of what that person is giving and kind of where they're at now. Um, for our annual campaign, it's you know we do um, we have a gentleman that does donate a matching gift. So it's easier for us to say like, you know, five becomes 10, 10 becomes 20. Um, so we throw out maybe in social media, we do kind of do lesser amounts because um, you're hitting such a wide variety of people um, too. 
I like for me, I know where my friends are at when I'm sharing it on social media. So I will even just ask for like, Hey, $25, Hey, $5. Don't go to Starbucks today. Um, but we're doing other events. Yeah. We're going to ask for more bigger money, but that's going to be a more personal call. Like if I'm going to call, pick up the phone and, and talk to somebody and I know them and I know what they're capable of giving, I'm going to ask them for, um, either a higher amount or a more specific number. Yeah. So I think the main takeaway here that I'm hearing is that, you know, if you're using a wide channel like social media or even email marketing to like a big list or a big audience, then you may want to adjust the dollar figure that you asked for to a lower amount that's more appropriate for uh, generally what you understand from your audience and demographics. Well, when you're doing one-to-one yeah. -one fundraising, you have either solid data of their giving history or a really strong relationship and understanding of who they are, where they're at, or how they've given. So then you can adjust the dollar ask based off of what you know about that. So that's great. Yeah. Um, one of the things you mentioned before is your third fundraising tip, which is to really focus on the branding aspect of a campaign. So. Um, what I want to do next is actually share with our audience what your peer-to-peer -peer campaign site looks like. And I'd love for you, uh, maybe if you can help us understand uh, what is branding to Carousel Ranch, what pieces of branding are important uh, for other folks to, to think about. So let me yeah. share. Okay. Yeah. So this is this is your recent campaign site, right? So can you take our audience yes. first, before we kind of dive into branding, uh, what is this uh, Carousel Wishes and Valentine Kisses campaign that you run every year in February. Yeah, so we, in February, it's an annual campaign that we're raising. Um, this actually goal is raised every year, um, but this past year was $115,000 to actually still have money coming in. Uh, as of yesterday, I had like $600 come in. It just hasn't been added yet. But for our Care Solutions Valentine Kisses campaign, um, we picked it in February in Santa Clarita, where, where our, um, our big donor base is located at. Um, there's not a lot of fundraising happening in February in our community. So we kind of picked that. And then we went to, well, February is Valentine's. Um, so our big tagline is in the month of February, um, when you give to the ones you love, will you please remember Carousel Ranch? So that's kind of how Carousel Wishes and Valentine Kisses came up. Um, so all month long, all of our campaign is about um, either Valentine's Day or love or hearts, or um, I think we use every Valentine's Day jargon in part of our campaign. <laughs> <laughs> that's hilarious. So, so how many years have you run this uh, fundraising campaign? I believe we started this campaign, I'm double checking, is since 2015. Okay. So for a long time. <laughs> okay. so, so it's been a while, um, but it, it seems like every year it follows something very similar in terms of format. And one of the things I really like a lot too is that traditionally speaking, a lot of organizations focus on uh, kind of like the peak giving months, which is year end or giving Tuesday or something in the spring. Uh, but what you all have done is done something different where you're saying, hey, here's here's an open part of the schedule where other organizations are not really seeing a lot of activity or we're not seeing a lot of activity. So let's create something of our own and have it in February. So I really love kind of that winter focus fundraising where other organizations, you may not be competing for mindshare um, when it comes to donors because mm -hmm. they're not thinking about, for example, year end giving when everybody is asking. Uh, last week we talked to, uh, we were in a conference with a bunch of other nonprofit leaders and one of our other local nonprofits came up to our executive director and said, Hey, I thought we talked about, there's no fundraising in February. Like, I thought, I think that's just well, no, no, no one fundraises in February. And she said, that's why we're fundraising in February. <laughs> it's because yeah. no one else is. And, uh, very much for us, like our holiday giving is a very, um, soft ask. We, we do a mailing. We do put something out there, but um, definitely not as strong as a few other nonprofits that do focus on holiday giving um, because in February we have this campaign and this is a hard ask. Like we, um, we, we, they get weekly emails, they get it on social media, they get it within the community. Um, so we, that's kind of how our structures worked for us and it, we've been really successful with it. 
Yeah. Um, let's walk through your structure. So I noticed that, you know, with this campaign site and Cosvox is powering this. So you're able to go in here, use one of our templates, customize it and brand it. Uh, so what parts of the branding are really important to you or what parts of the branding that you think other nonprofits should really focus on when they set up some type of fundraising campaign? So for us, we want to make sure, um, so for our logo, I don't know if you can see in like the small corner, we have that carousel horse and the four color blocks. Um, with that and our two other main events of the year, um, we keep obviously the horse logo and then we implement it with something else. So obviously the heart. Um, so all month long, people see the heart and the our logo together. They still have that recognition like, oh, the carousel horse, that's carousel ranch. But, oh, it's February has the heart. Um, for us, we keep it with also coloring wise, um, red has been really, we like red, um, red pinks, um, have kind of kept within it. And then for us, our messaging has stayed the same. Um, we tweak it obviously for, um, current events. Um, you can see right here, we talk about this is our 25th year as an organization. Um, so we're talking about 25 years last year, we were coming out of the pandemic. So we use a lot of, uh, wording of, Hey, help us. Um, still be here in the years to come, help us recover. Um, so, but a lot of the same thing of love, it's all about love. Keep your kids in our hearts. Um, for us, it's the same, the same wording we're using year after year after year. So people get used to that, um, as well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so since you're doing this year after year, um, I assume that, um, you're not setting up this campaign site from scratch year after year. So do you use some of the cloning features yes. to save some time in spinning up this yes, campaign? Yes, I was Yeah, I was just talking to one of my staff. I love Cosbox because this, again, everything stays the same. Um, we do very minor tweaks, but Cosbox has been amazing because we can just clone everything. Um, so when we, next year, next February, when we do this again, we just copy it and it's, it's here. We switch out a U YouTube link. Um, we update the wording. It, it changes within minutes instead of takes such a long time. Our peer to peer fundraisers love it as well too, because the cloning effect also moves our participants over, um, and their pages are able to stay the same. Um, so we just have to do minor tweaks to their testimonies. Um, so I, I love that. That's actually one of the main reasons why we stay with Cosbox year after year. Um, is just how user-friendly it is for us and for all of our peer-to-peer -peer fundraisers. Yeah, I think that's great to hear. So, so with this, uh, you're cloning the peer-to-peer -peer campaign year after year. Um, so let's talk about peer-to-peer -peer real fast because I do notice that you're using both individual personal pages for your participants, and then you're also using mm -hmm. a, our concept of team pages for, it sounds like uh, there's different families that come, uh, like a Saturday family, for example. So. Yeah. Uh, so this is your peer-to-peer -peer section here on your uh, Carousel Ranch uh, February campaign site. So uh, I see you have a listing of different individual fundraisers. Let me click on Isabel over here. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, so this is Isabel's personal fundraising page. Um, so who do you get uh, to participate in your peer-to-peer -peer campaign? Who is Isabel? Who are other folks? Uh, and how did you get people to really sign up uh, to create these personal pages? So our peer-to-peer -peer fundraisers um, are, are parents. Um, we have individuals that come to the ranch as part of our equestrian therapy program. Um, you see Saturday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Friday. And um, they're our first people to ask. We always see, hey, you know, we're raising money for the ranch. Are you able to do it? Um, most of the time, parents, of course, will do it. They know that the work we're doing in this, this, the service we provide is so invaluable to them. Um, they're, they're always like, of course, and it, we we make it really easy for them. Um, you can see a lot of these graphics. These graphics we make in house, um, and we're constantly switching them out. Um, we make it as easy as possible for our fundraisers to to share on social media or to email or to text. Um, so our parents are number one. Um, the next is our staff and our board. We always we try and get 100% participation from our staff. Um, so if they're not doing a personal page, we still ask them to give. Um, same thing with our board as well. Um, and then beyond that, we do friends of the ranch, volunteers, people who have donated in the past. 
Um, it just depends on the individual. If we have a pretty close relationship with them, we just ask. And the worst thing they can say is no. <laughs> um, so that's who we come up with right now. For us, we like to try and have um, over 60 active fundraisers. Um, part of our strategic plan and growing this specific campaign is growing our peer to peer fundraisers year by year. Okay, we need to get, um, you know, we need to get five more fundraisers this year. We need 10 more fundraisers, but they need to be actually active. They need to be giving, um, posting, and trying to raise money. Um, and for us, the where our money comes in are these pages, our peer to peer fundraisers. Um, bring in about 60% of raised funds uh, of the money raised in this campaign. Uh, I've never, how these individuals, how parents and board members are able to get people we can't reach, um, people in their own social circles that we can't reach to give hundreds and thousands of dollars is always so moving for us and we're always blown away. Um, but yeah, that's how, that's who we ask. Um, I recently was talking to another um, executive director and she asked, do you ask your clients? And I'm always like, yes, because they're the biggest advocates for our, for our mission and for our program. They know how, they know the why our program works. You know, they're the stories that we get to tell. But of course, like you have to ask them and they're happy, usually happy to, to participate. We have a handful of parents that don't or board members that choose to give a different way. But um, you just have to ask. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I really like this because it ties back to um, what you said earlier in terms of a fundraising tip of how you do fundraising, which is have a compelling story, have a really strong why, and then and have a strong call to action to make a donation. So it sounds like one of the pieces of your peer-to-peer -peer strategy is to really identify folks that have the most compelling story, most compelling why, and then equip them with these graphics, social media posts, et cetera, so they can go out there and just tell their story and have a good reason for why their audience should make a donation on their personal pages or team fundraising pages. So, so I love that. Yeah. Uh, for our peer-to-peer -peer fundraisers, um, we actually have a list of every year of all of our fundraisers, people done in the past, people we want to ask in the future. Um, we actually start asking them before year end. So we usually give them about two months um, heads up so that way we're not asking a week before the campaign starts. So definitely you want to get our peer to peer fundraiser set up as early as possible because you can see on Isabella, she wrote a beautiful testimony about working um, about her son, but that takes time for people to sit down and come up with thoughts of like, how am I going? What's my story? And how can I get my friends and family to donate to this, this, um, this cause? So that's something huge for us and that we do. And then for our board members who are a little bit, a little bit removed, you know, they don't have personal stories like this. They don't have kids in the program. We provide the story. We always give them like, Hey, this is a testimony I have of Isabella or Kenan or Bodie. And then I can um, give that to them. They can share their story as well. But yeah, storytelling is key. That's the reason why we do what we do. Uh, and that's the reason why we fundraise so well is the storytelling. Yeah, yeah, I, I love that part of it where um, not only are you, are you finding people with great stories to tell, but then you're also providing templates and toolkits to folks who, um, who may not have the time or may not have a direct connection in order to tell a compelling story so that they can still go out there and have a strong why and send it out to their friends and family. Um, so I noticed here on this, you're also using teams. Uh, you have the board of directors, you have staff, and you have parents. Um, I think it's really interesting where uh, you're using the team functionality to create these different subgroups on your peer-to-peer -peer campaign. Um, talk to us about why you're using this and um, what kind of success you've seen by segmenting out your peer-to-peer -peer audience this way. Yeah, we... Um... We like the team aspect um, we're here at Carousel Ranch. We're all about we're one, we're one family. Um, so our Tuesday parents or our Saturday parents, when they come to the ranch, there's um, a sense of community. Um, you know, they're, um, oh, the way our program works is that if you're riding on 2.30 on a Tuesday, you're, that's your spot forever until you need to move or make a schedule change. So a lot of these parents know each other. Um, we also created the teams in a sense of a good, healthy competition. 
uh, to kind of, um, we have a parent board right outside of our, our arena. And we say like, where are teams coming in? And then we usually have an incentive, like whoever raises the most, um, they, we get, we give them like a $5 gift card or, you know, we give them a small treat. Um, so we do create a healthy, um, a healthy competition, but we have a handful of parents that aren't able to do the peer to peer fundraising, um, for personal reasons. And, but we still want them to feel like they're part of, they're still making a difference because we still ask them to donate, um, whatever they're comfortable with. And, but they're still part of the team. They're still an active participant in this fundraiser for us. Um, so we didn't want them to be a donation lost in the list and list of donations. Uh, we want to make sure their donations being counted towards their team. Um, really try to make sure they are feeling ownership of their donation and that even though they're not fundraising for us, they're still making a difference. They're making an impact. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like that aspect of it, um, because then the healthy competition allows people to, um, you know, just have a reason and incentive to to further uh, their fundraising pages, but also you're making it inclusive too for folks who uh, don't have the ability um, to create a personal page, they can still feel like they're part of a community and not get lost uh, in the giant pool of donors. So I really like that aspect of it. Um, you know, you mentioned before- say competition. Oh, sorry. I have to say competition is, is fun. I have um, actually board members that contact me and they're competitive. They're like, blah, 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 a hundred dollars more than me. I need to get a hundred dollars more. So it's been really fun uh, chatting with them. Obviously they, they know if they don't raise the most, they're okay. But uh, yeah, it's fun talking with them and they're getting excited because they're like, I want to be so-and-so. Um, or I have a couple parents like that too, where they want to be the most, what parent it raises the most. So it's fun. I enjoy it. Uh, and we love encouraging them too. We're like, yeah, raise more money for us. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, uh, when it comes to the, your peer to peer campaign, uh, what, what feature and functionality have you seen a lot of success with? I know you mentioned the personal pages and team pages, and that's what we've been talking about, but is there anything kind of specific of uh, that has surprised you or something that, uh, you've seen a, a large amount of return from? For us, um, kind of on your back end, what I really enjoy, so I love that you guys are so user-friendly and a yeah. lot of our, we, we've used other peer-to-peer platforms. Um, I believe one year we actually ended up using something else and we came back to you guys because we were having so much issues. Our our peer-to-peer fundraisers were having problems with um, with just the other site. And so people loved, loved your site, but I do have once in a while, uh, a fundraiser was like, I can't, I can't format this picture. Can you help me? And I can go in on the back end and I can help, I can assist them. I can update their, their text. I can add a, a graphic. Um, that's been really positive. I also love that because we've been doing this year after year, if I look up in their donation, someone's name, I can see their donation history. Um, for us, that's huge, especially when we're trying to compare where we are, were last year, 2019 or 2020, um, kind of where we're going and, oh, okay, what do I need to ask for them moving forward? Um, those have been the most things that stood out to me. I love it. I love that um, we can throw in a YouTube video. A lot of our peer to peer fundraisers also use the video aspect as well. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I, those are some of the top things that we've, we've really enjoyed. Yeah, yeah, I really like the aspect of how um, you can really customize the story on your campaign sites, and as your campaign progresses, you can update and modify it. Um, and I think that's really mm -hmm. valuable, as especially if when you're so focused on the storytelling aspect of it, having the easy way to update a YouTube video or post a YouTube video on not only your your peer to peer campaign site. But uh, for your peer to peer fundraisers and participants to update their pages with a refresh graphics um, in a toolkit or a new story. So I think that's really valuable. Um, I think one of the things that you mentioned before is, in terms of seeing history is, is this, where uh, we have a contacts tab. And this is something that mm -hmm. we launched maybe like two or three years ago. So this is, this is before. Uh, it, I mean, this is like after you first started. So this is, I think what's interesting yeah. is as cause logs we've grown too. And then it sounds mm -hmm. like what you do is you easily just log in into a specific peer-to-peer -peer fundraiser. And then you can see like their year after year, how much they fundraise on their page. And then you can even see mm -hmm. uh, just all the donations that they received. 
uh, when it comes to uh, their peer-to-peer -peer page. So you can really see, okay, here's my, here's my lifetime value almost in a sense of one of my participants who's a peer-to-peer -peer fundraiser. So I, I think that's a really interesting aspect where you can see the history of it. Um, I think the other aspect- Yeah, we love it. And I love that that's great about the Cosbox is that you're constantly updating. And um, I've actually loved all of your upgrades and how you guys have constantly changed too. So um, yeah, this has been a huge helpful for us, especially, you know, and again, we love to ask because we can't, even if they say no, they say no. But if we have a fundraiser that fundraised last year and they didn't this year and they, they had a donor that gave a good, a good amount, a good significant gift. Uh, we always want to go and ask them again. And then we bring them back to that person. We're like, Hey, um, again, who's Kevin? Hey, Kevin, I saw, you know, last year you donated to, um, Isabella's page. Would you, we're still doing the fundraising again. She's not doing a personal page, but your donation will still count. And most of the time they do donate, but we want to bring them back to like, how do you know us? How did you give to us before? Oh, you gave because you did it through, through Isabella. Mm. Yeah, so it sounds like you adjust the messaging and you adjust the ask based on the source mm -hmm. of, of the donor. So you, uh, you don't treat all your donors the same. Uh, for folks who come in through peer-to-peer, -peer, there's a specific messaging, a specific nurturing that happens. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. I think that's something to really consider too, because not all donors are the same. So thinking about uh, where did this donor come from? Did it come from my website or from an event or from peer-to-peer? -peer? And then speaking specifically uh, to uh, those peer-to-peer -peer fundraisers in order to get a returning gift. I think that's that's a great strategy uh, to focus on. Um, awesome. Let me see. Now, when it comes to peer-to-peer, uh, -peer, let's say, uh, I know I'm asking way in advance, 11 months in advance. So for next year, 2023, uh, what's one thing that you wanna try out or change when it comes to your peer-to-peer -peer campaign? For us, I actually was just talking, cause we're, we do this, and it's 11 months is never enough time. We're constantly, adapting our messaging or our fundraiser, like what works out better next year. Um, for us, we, we want to make sure our fundraisers are prepped and ready way in advance. We try and get them um, everything they need, but we still come up to right at that, that, um, the first day that we're starting February 1st. So earlier, the better we try, the things come in the way, but we do ask majority of our fundraisers back in December uh, but making sure they're in their hands are the different graphics, their messaging is all firm. Um, also for us for next year, we really want to push our fundraisers to use um, texting a little bit more. Um, emails are probably something we really want to push to um, because we were seeing with Facebook and their algorithm, um, we've been having a little difficulty of just people to see our pages, to see peer to peer. Um, but you have so many other options. You have texting, you have email, there is Instagram. They can give through Instagram as well. Um, we just put our, our cause box link in our bio. So really trying to focus on our fundraisers. There's more than one way to donate. It's not just Facebook. You have to ask in other, um, other platforms as well. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. I think expanding to different channels and giving your peer to peer fundraisers, uh, options uh, would help them reach their friends. Um, I think one thing that's really interesting too that I didn't see on your settings side, so this is just your admin side over here. Um, one of the things maybe that uh, you can consider, uh, especially when it comes to next year's fundraising is having a link to your fundraising toolkit. So I know you focus a lot on providing resources. So this is one of the features mm -hmm. that we have on Cosvox uh, where uh, when one of your participants set up their peer-to-peer -peer page, uh, then they have a section in their account site where they can click on to get additional resources. Uh, so it can be a link on your website or it can be a Dropbox or a Google Drive folder with uh, updated like social media stuff, uh, for example. So that's something that uh, I did see here that could be interesting for 2023. Uh, so you can have something where folks can just self-service and get the latest resources. That would be great. Actually, we did have a toolkit that we just email out to everyone. I didn't realize there was one. Uh, that's the one thing about when you're constantly doing it every year is that sometimes uh, we just 
keep going, moving forward. We don't take the time to look back and be like, what's different in a year? So uh, a tip for everyone to go look and make sure uh, you're up to date with all the changes of Poswox. Yeah. But yeah, for us, um, we do use a toolkit and that's been really helpful for us. We actually, um, we do use a toolkit, but we, because again, personal fundraisers are, our peer-to-peer fundraisers is everything for us. It's the reason why our our, our, our campaign is successful. Um, we're on top of them all the time. I feel like our parents, our fundraisers are probably sick of us, um, but we send out a weekly email to them personally. Um, we text them all the time and we're like, hey, did you share today? Did you do this today? Um, it's a lot of work, but you see the results. You see that we're, we're raising a ton of money and we can't do it with just the four of us that we have in our current office that's working on the fundraising. We need the peer-to-peer fundraisers. Yeah. Well, I think it's different to the perspective where uh, instead of you as an organization making the ask, you're you're not the quarterback anymore when it comes to fundraising. You're actually the coach. So all your participants yes. are the quarterbacks and you kind of just need to nurture, 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 remind, 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 and coach them in the right direction so they can be successful. I think that's an interesting concept shift uh, where it's very different than typical fundraising that happens. So I want to end with this, uh, just one question. What is the number one uh, fundraising uh, pet peeve that you have that you see other nonprofits that you know committing? So what is your number one fundraising pet peeve? I think um, this one's come up within the past two years with COVID. Um, Things have been hard. And we understand, especially in the fundraising world, um, there's so many, so many unknowns. Um, our take is no is not, not, no is not an option. Giving up is not an option. Um, the past two years we have persevered. It's been really hard on us and it's, it's challenged us and we're spread out thin, but, um, in 2020, we, we still did our big event. Um, we still fundraise and I know a lot of people were hesitant to do an event, but we just moved to an on home, uh, at home portion. Last year, we did our big event and we um, we had less people and we had an at-home, um, an at-home option. So both people felt safe. Uh, my biggest pet peeve is when people just give up. Don't give up. We're, we're still serving people. Um, still try. There are ways to get creative. It might be uncomfortable, but and it might not be what we're used to, but I promise positive things come out of it what, how we did our fundraiser last year, it was hard. I mean, we're in the middle of the summer when we do our biggest fundraiser and it's, it was an outdoor event. It's a hundred degrees, but last year's fundraiser was so successful. It's actually, we raised the most money we had in the 25 years we've been doing the event and it was different, but we learned so much about the event and our donor base that we're moving forward, um, changing things up. It's okay to change things up. Uh, People might feel weird about it, but uh, going mobile, having an online auction, doing, being comfortable with the, um, internet and the online world is okay. And that's us moving forward as a, um, nonprofit world. Like this is, this is how we're doing things. So yeah, just don't be afraid to go for it. Um, in our, in our community, I saw a lot of, um, organizations just take the easy way out and not doing their event or that instead of doing the hard work. So just try just get creative, pull on people. Don't be afraid to ask um, because the people that we serve, the populations that we serve, they need us uh, because their needs don't go away. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's so encouraging to hear where it's um, about persevering, being persistent and not being afraid of adapting and trying new things, even though it's hard work, even though it's uncomfortable. So I think it's great that uh, Taylor, you can share uh, some of your some of your success stories and inspire um, other nonprofits to do the same. Now, uh, I wanna close with uh, just asking, uh, how can other folks learn about Carousel Ranch or learn about Taylor Adachi? I'm curious if someone has questions, if they wanna support you, where can they go for more info? They can go to our website to learn more about Carousel Ranch. It's uh, www.carouselranch.org. Um, they can check out our Facebook or Instagram um, at Carousel Ranch, or they can email us at hello at carouselranch.org. Um, and it goes directly to myself. It goes to a lot of our, our admin staff and our executive director. But um, we're here. We're always happy to help. Um, 
there's plenty of love and um, to go around here. So uh, happy to happy to help and make others another nonprofit successful. Amazing. Well, Taylor, thanks so much for the time today. And we're super excited that Carousel Ranch is doing well, is adapting, but also seeing successes that it hasn't seen in 25 years history. So setting new records in PR yeah. every single day. So I love that. Thanks so much for your time, Taylor. Really appreciate it. <laughs>